what's going on champ welcome to gully tv what's the deal man i'm honored to uh to be here with you right now getting interviewed hanging out i'm a huge fan of gully tv Without, look, let's talk about that for a minute man mm -hmm. because i'm a, um i'm a huge jason weaver fan as well how did my platform come across how, how did you discover gully tv to be honest with you it was randomly um I'm one of those type of people where I just, I'm always searching around the web because I'm curious. I'm always looking for new information, um, different points of view, as, especially as it relates to the culture. And um, I was surfing around YouTube and, and I happened to see something about Gully TV and specifically um, an episode related to Haitian Jack. Okay. And when I watched it... Um, I was really surprised, well, pleasantly surprised, I should say, as to how informative it was. Right. Uh, well executed uh, from the interviewer's point of, or interviewer's perspective. Uh, and as a journalist, um, I really dug what Jack was saying. The Jack way, kept it real. The way that you referred to him as Jack is like you, you might have had an encounter with him at some point. You've been in the entertainment business a long time. Mm -hmm. Any Haitian Jack encounters? Yeah, he doesn't remember it because as, as, probably as far as he was concerned, I was just another kid in the crowd. But I used to see Jack around a lot. Um, I was living in New York um, around the latter part of the 90s going into early 2000s because I was a signed artist with Motown. Right. Um, and I was originally signed through Gerald Busby. Uh, he was he was the one who gave me my first deal at Motown. But there was a point where um, uh, the staff at Motown had transitioned. And they gave Andre Harrell an opportunity to head up Motown. Right. And he more or less brought in like his whole staff from um, Uptown Records. And that was really popular back then in that day. And he brought that whole crew so the the new mantra for Motown back in that day was the whole kind of new jack swing uptown shit you know what I'm saying that they were trying to kind of merge with the legacy the pre-existing legacy of what Motown already was which was Marvin Gaye and the Jacksons and all of that they oh. were they were trying to figure out a way to merge what Andre Harrell already did really well at that time on top of the Motown legacy and that's where I kind of fit in I was one of the artists that was fortunate enough to kind of uh, stay on during that transition and that's what brought me to New York he wanted all of his artists uh, to be there okay. so that they could kind of pick up you know a vibe or you know connect with some of the producers that um, they were directly affiliated with or have relationships with and um, they just felt like it was imperative at the time for me as a young artist to come to New York and fill it out and build relationships and to be honest with you it was, it was one of the one of the more rewarding experiences of my life as a as an entertainer and as an artist okay can you recall the first time seeing yo who is this guy right here because Jack he, Haitian Jack has that type of presence where mm -hmm. it would if you didn't know him, you might ask somebody else in the room, like, who was that right there? Mm-hmm. Can you recall? Yeah. Um, there were a couple spots, actually. I, I saw Jack um, a couple times at Esso that Maria Davis used to do. I think it was, like, on a Wednesday. Okay. Shout out to Maria Davis. Right. Um, share share my view. Share with, with my viewers who Maria Davis is and where they might associate the name. Well, Maria Davis is Harlem. Uh, the Davis family is Harlem. One, one of my closest friends. It, it, as far as I'm concerned, the Davis family is family. Right. Um, Reasonable doubt album. Yeah. Uh, she she was the one that that was on that that had the skit on Reasonable Doubt with Jay Z and. She was talking about like, oh, you know, y'all need to stop fighting in the club. I forgot. Somebody exactly smoking reefer. Right. Yeah. That was her thing. That okay. was Maria. That that's Maria Davis. All right. Um, and uh, Maria has been uh, instrumental in helping to give 
artists, especially from New York, a platform by which they could showcase their talents. So these were showcases that she was having? Yeah, they were like showcases and parties and where, where people in the city would get together and hang out. Um, industry people and just regular people alike. Like that's where I first saw Jay Z and Dame Dash, like, and and Biggs and them pulling up in a white, uh, what was that E three twenty or whatever, right. um, with the Rockefeller emblem on the side of it. Like I was there to see that. I was the kids, the bad boy when Puff was literally the the king of New York, and it was kids from New York from all five boroughs, like in bad boy coach jackets like a fucking army in the street and with this this is this all of this was contained within the Maria Davis showcases and shit like yeah, that. Yeah. Because she was she was one of the ones it was like her spot, the tunnel, the palladium. Right. Uh Latin Quarter, I think. Yeah, because I went there a couple times. It was like a few spots in the city during that time where like everybody used to kinda hang out and and, he, he, and Maria he, Davis like, yeah. He was she somebody probably. that stood out in the crowd. Yep. What What was it about him that made you, yo, who was that or why did he stand out? Well, with Jack, it was like, he was bring, keeping it all the way real. Like, he was bringing model chicks into this. Like, Puff was doing that, bringing model chicks into the black spots and the right. hip-hop shit. Right. But, like, it was a select few of brothers who was bringing the fashion pop music like where it was where you could literally classify it as ghetto fabulous right and there were only a few cats that were really doing that and at that time um, right. as far as I was concerned and that was like Puff and Jay and um, and Dame and all of them and like and then the street cats like Jack right a few others like I mean Von Zip was, uh, he was a little bit older, but, I mean, all those cats from Harlem, like, I, I remember all of that, like, yeah. it was, it was a, it was a movement. Jack was coming through with them divas. Yep. <laughs> he said, yep. Divas, whips, the, the shit, like, the shit that niggas were talking about in their records. Right. That, he was living that. Wow. He really was. I saw him, I was like, man, you know, it was a few of those cats like that, that really. When did you, when did you get. Uh, you know, when did you get hip to the name? When did you get to to the part where yo, that's Haitian Jack right there, or that's his name is Jack? It was kind of like in passing, cause I'm from Chicago, uh -huh. and when I came to New York, it was like I didn't know anybody. Um, the person that showed me what was going on in New York was my big brother, still is my big brother, Chuck Bone. Okay. Um. And uh, my man, Mr. Rogers, and Chuck Barrett, like, those guys, they were from the city, so they were the ones, like, coaching me through what was going on, because Chicago has a different feel, like, we're, we're a gangster town, mm -hmm. so I was used to understanding, you know, from a street level, like, sets and neighborhoods and you know, shit like yeah. that, like, when you came to New York, you had to understand crews and boroughs and... Uh -huh. Niggas is getting money and like it was a whole different kind of thing. So I was taught in a way about what was going on on the street level in New York from friends of mine and people that I had direct relationships with. It was like, hey, because I all me personally, I always want to know what's going on. Right. I don't ever want to be like blindsided. And I don't ever want to be in a position where I don't know who I'm around. I always no want to be aware of my surroundings and who's around me at all times. Okay. Keeping all the way funky. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, me, just naturally, when I see cats moving a certain kind of way, I'll be like, yo, who that? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And it was, you know, it was, it was cats that was moving around that was getting money, but then there was some that were moving around in a way. you like, oh. And he was one of them, you know. Yeah. He just he was, had that standout quality about him. Yeah, yeah. That's why when I saw the um, interview with y'all, right, I was like, oh man, Jack's still doing his thing. Like that guy that he is in that interview, like yeah. is from what I remember seeing from afar. Right. Like I said, I don't know that man like that. Right. But from what I saw from afar, just on some 
young nigga shit. Like I was fifteen in the club. Right. Right. Real shit. Yeah. Fifteen in the club, like kicking it with Big and Puff and all them niggas. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And seeing like get money cats walking around. Yeah, it was real. What was the tunnel like, man? I when earlier today when we were talking about Jack per se, you mm -hmm. mentioned the tunnel. What was the tunnel like? And what was that experience like being so young, being in there? And shit? Amazing. Amazing that um, looking back in retrospect, and and what that represented for hip hop culture, right at the time. Um, I think we understood at the time that it was something special that was going on, but when you look back, and especially where you know kind of hip hop is right now, and I'm not saying that anything's bad with it, but um. The tunnel was something special, man, because it was like that was the mecca for hip hop. Yeah. It was like, you know, when you wanted to see the creme de la creme of the culture, they would be there. I, I'll never forget, excuse me, Puff premiered Get Money at the tunnel. Right. Doing Funk Master Flex set. He had literally just come from Daddy's House Studios. Right. And they had just finished the record. And I think he had like a rough mix on it. But that shit was so hot. That he was like, yo, I got to take it to tone. And just break the record in New York and go and go crazy. And I shit you not. Like they played that record 20 times. I was in the club that night. Word. They played that shit over and over and over again. And I've never seen a club to this day turn up the way that that shit did i mean it was like puff was like that movement that bad boy movement it was amazing man it was unreal in a club that you know um basically was home to athletes mm -hmm. entertainers rappers and street gangsters mm -hmm. what did you uh how did you find your place in the tunnel where you felt that you were comfortable at I mean, it, to, to so I heard, I, I've interviewed people and I've heard stor stories about the tunnel. People lose their furs in the tunnel and they lose jewelry in the tunnel. No, nah, I mean, you would literally, they would, uh, this would bug me out when I when I first started going there. They would ask cats, like, you go through the metal detector yeah, and then they have you empty out your pockets. They have you take your Tims off or your shoes off, have you lift up your hat, and then they have you lift up your tongue. Yeah. Because back in the day, the shit was carrying like a razor blade. Under yeah. your tongue, where a motherfucker can just and give you a buck fifty New straight, York. like New York shit. And, and I mean, they really were doing that in the club. So when I, was, <laughs> when, I when I be coming in, I'd be like, "Why? Why are they doing?" Like I remember, I asked Chuck specifically. I was like, "Why are they doing that?" He's like, "Oh no, because they need to be having razor blades in it." I was like, "Word!" And I'm 15. Yeah. <laughs> coming from Chicago, I'm like, "What? They they got." Why are they spitting out raises? It was a whole, you know, it was a whole thing. But it kind of added to the character of the club because it always hinged on this this thing of anything can happen, but you knew that you were in a safe zone right. when it came to the culture. Right. Like, you knew it could pop off, and sometimes it would. You knew it could pop off at any given time. But at the same time, you knew that you were where it happens, where the magic happens, what it's all about when you talk about hip hop. So it was just, it was really one of those special, special places, man. Like, insane, insane, fond memories. Speaking of special, you got a signature role. Um, you, you was blessed to play the, the late great Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that, man. That's big business right there, man. What's, yeah. What was that like playing the great one? Blessing. Word. Um, to this day, man, and I'll always be thankful for him. Thankful to the Lord for it. Right. Um, the way that the opportunity was presented to me. Um, the way that I was um, given the ability to step up to the plate and execute when I was called upon on down to the way that the fans of Michael Jackson received my performance. It was all God. I give all glory and credit to God. Uh -huh. um, 
it was an amazing experience. I had the chance to play the role of a lifetime, what most people would, you know, dream or just kill, you know, to, to do. Um, I'm honored by the fact that I was chosen by Michael himself to play him. Um, and I don't know. They, I, the only thing that I can say about that experience, just point blank period, is just that I'm grateful. Can I'm you, grateful. Can you recollect the day that you met? Explain and um, share with us the day that you met Michael Jackson and he came to the set. And the, the clandestine method that he came to the set on the low. Yeah. No, I mean, the, the way that people, um, or the way it's been described in the press as far as like how Michael was secretive and, or not secretive, but uh, elusive, um, just due to the fact that he was Michael Jackson. He visited the Jackson set many a time, like, in disguise. Just on some, you know, just popping up and seeing what was going on. And um, then I got the opportunity to meet him in that regard. Um, here's, here's what I'll say about Mike, and this is what I want people to understand. Um... Michael was a genius. He was blessed with something that not a lot of us will be able to fully comprehend and understand. And with that kind of blessing it comes a great deal of power. And from that power you have people coming around you that some have good intentions that want to help you and, and some don't. Uh -huh. And unfortunately for him... I think that there were more people around him that were looking to take advantage of him versus help him, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, display this utopia or euphoric, you know, kind of um, um, image that he was trying to project. I think Michael really had really good intentions at the end of the day, but I think the music business in itself and the way that the industry is and how they just look to exploit and divide and conquer... Right. I think at the end of the day, that's what really kind of played into, you know, Michael um, feeling the way that he felt. And I don't want to say like his demise because I, I, I don't think ever at any point that Michael had like a downturn. I just right. think that he suffered and went through a lot, man. It was like really heartbroken just due to the fact that he wanted to share his gift in a genuine way with people and then when it was all said and done it was everything that he intended to do and he felt that was coming from a righteous angle it was just twisted and, and used against them and and like I, I, I mean I don't know man I, I don't know how to really uh, how to word it properly because there, there are so many different elements to that and I'm sure that there are a lot of people that will look at this interview now and have a difference of opinion or maybe have a rebuttal or something to offer um, that's opposite of what I feel about him. But I just think that Michael's a genius, and I feel bad at the end of the day that when he left here, seemingly, he didn't feel like he was appreciated. Kind of felt like he was being attacked more than being like appreciated for the artist that he was and the gift that he was trying to share with everybody. And right. I think that's the... the the heart the most heartbreaking thing as it relates to his legacy that I can that I can think of. But other than that I I appreciate and love him and his family for the fact that they gave me an opportunity, just a kid from Chicago. Right. Um, to be able to display my talent. They gave me a platform. Um, gave me an opportunity to connect with so many different people around the world. And um, I'm eternally grateful for that. No doubt, you was. I hope that wasn't too worried. Nah, man, that was incredible, man. That was because I mean, really, very, like, because I don't want people sincere. to get it misconstrued, like, because so many people have like an opinion right. about him and his legacy, but I can only speak for myself, nah, like, man, sincere. if it wasn't for Michael, man, like, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now, man. You know what I'm saying? A if, and the, his family. A lot of the uh, the days that you were recording the movie, you said that the family was on set. Mm hmm. So you got a chance to interact with Joe, some of the brothers, Tito. What was that like? Well, Jermaine was Jermaine, Jermaine and um, his wife at the time, Margaret um, Maldonado. Okay.